the Lancashire connection helped. Uh, Wazim came to Lancashire in about, oh, what, 1987 or 88, which was about the time that I started at Lancashire as well. I was at university for three years between 87 and 89, but I came back halfway through the summer to play for Lancashire. So I got to know Wazim really well. We played together at Old Trafford for 10 years or so. Um, and whilst the cricket was obviously, you know, I wanted to win for England, he wanted to win for Pakistan. In 96, the cricket was, you know, hard fought as it would always be. There was no sense of it carrying over to anything other than friendship off the field. Pakistan were a very good team then um, and they beat us convincingly 2-0, I think, at home in England. Uh, but the relationships between the players were cordial. I can't say it was completely down to myself and Wazim, but I think it helped that we knew each other well and we'd played together at Old Trafford for a long time. Well, it's been one of the great sadnesses that international cricket left Pakistan for the best part of, what, seven or eight years after that uh, attack in 2009. And it can't have been easy from all kinds of perspectives to play in the UAE, both from the players often playing in front of empty ground, in, in, empty crowds, uh, constantly away from home on the road. You know, what other team had had to play virtually 12 months a year on the road? And then the cost, in terms of financial cost to the PCB, which must have been significant uh, over that period. So given all those disadvantages, for Pakistan to remain competitive, uh, for the game still to be uh, widely followed here in Pakistan, you know, it says a lot about the depth of feeling for the game here in this country, I think. Um, and it's great to see cricket come back now, which is part of the reason I'm here. We're filming a little uh, documentary for the summer about the return of cricket. Um, and so it's fantastic to see teams and players from other countries coming back and feeling, you know, comfortable about coming back to play in Pakistan again. Well, you only have to look around at the crowds and the enthusiasm uh, for every game so far that I've seen in the PSL, you know, packed houses in places like Multan and Karachi and here. Um, but just as importantly, all those foreign players who, who have come and will now f know that cricket is safe in Pakistan and will be able to tell that message to their players from their own countries. You know, I was in the Pearl Continental last night in the cafe and there were about eight or nine English players gathered around all chatting. There's Moen Ali, Ravi Bapara, Tom Banton, uh, Lewis Gregory, uh, Liam Dawson, you know, there's a whole load of them there and they're, they're all, they were all saying how much they've enjoyed the competition, the competitions, you know, it's, it's great standard, they feel perfectly safe here. So that message will get passed back and that will encourage more, more players and more teams to come. Well, when I played against them, they had some great bowlers in particular. I mean, if you think, I was trying to think of the last attack that I played on my tour here of 2000, it would have been Wazim and Wakar, and then Mushtaq and Saklain. Now, you've got four great match-winning bowlers there. And I think that's, Pakistan have produced great batsmen, of course, and great all-rounders, but I think in recent times, the strength and depth of their bowling and they're particularly their kind of wicket-taking bowlers, pace bowlers and, and mystery spinners have set them apart. Um, and I, I don't know why that is that Pakistan particularly produces great bowlers. I suspect it's something to do with the relative lack of infrastructure. You know, in order to produce lots and lots of great batsmen, you've got to have facilities and infrastructure and coaches and a, and a very formal system. But I think bowlers can spring and emerge from anywhere, and that's probably why Pakistan produced so many. Well, it should be terrific. It's, it's a big summer for England. It, it won't be as big as last summer because that was the World Cup and the Ashes, which are always slightly different. Uh, but we've got Pakistan coming and we've got West Indies coming. And Pakistan have had a very good record against England in recent years in England. Um, and so they're always, you know, a valuable team to come and, and they'll get good support. The crowds will be good. The cricket should be good. Um, it should be highly competitive. So we're looking forward to seeing Pakistan in England this summer.
Well, Baba Azam looks a, a fabulous player to me. Um, you know, he looks so skillful and the game looks so easy to him at times. So very much looking forward to watching him play, which is a challenge for players when they come from the subcontinent to England. You know, in the last two or three years in England, the conditions have been extreme, actually, with the Duke's ball and the floodlights and the, you know, the way the ball has moved around. So it's going to be a challenge for all Pakistan's batsmen, but I should think he'll be up to it. Um, well, I, I actually didn't come back from when I toured in 2000, and then the next time I came was about 2014-15. I came back to do a, a series on Imran Khan, your Prime Minister, before he was Prime Minister. So we, we went to Islamabad and we spent a little bit of time on the road with him up in, uh, up in KP in the north and then in Kashmir. Uh, and then we did a big long sit-down interview with him at his house in Islamabad and we're talking really about his political aspirations and you know his hopes and dreams of becoming Prime Minister and, and we, we, we did a long long sit-down with him about an hour and a half and his final words to me were one day I'm gonna win and he has won obviously so hoping to catch up with him in a couple of days time as well. Well, I've been at it a fair while, so I retired in 2002, so I've been doing it almost as long, if not longer, than I played. Um, I've been lucky with the people that I've worked with at Sky in England, who continue to, you know, cover the game well, have the resources to do it well. They allow us to come to places like Pakistan and do these documentaries, whether it's on Imran or the return of cricket here. So it's not just about the cricket, there's a kind of, they allow us to tell stories around the cricket, which is great, and I, I, I love doing all that. And then I'm lucky, you know, on the writing side of it, that I, I write for The Times, uh, which is a great newspaper in England. So kind of lucky with the people that I work with, um, and I enjoy the job, you know, I enjoy watching cricket, talking to cricketers, telling stories about cricket. Um, I think you have, to, you have to enjoy it, you have to love the game. Um, because there's a lot of it and if you don't you know it's gonna get pretty uh, pretty dull so you gotta love it and I still do it's not easy and I don't feel it's my job to criticize I, th I think it's your job to uh, speak honestly and truthfully you still need to empathize with the players remember how tough the game is how difficult the game is Occasionally you, you do have to criticise, there's no way around it. But I think if you're fair and the players know that you're, you've not got an axe to grind uh, and that you're being you know, fair-minded, then I think that's fine. Well, I don't really regard myself as having a team. I mean, I'm English, obviously, and I want England to win. But it, essentially, when I've got the microphone in my hand, I regard myself as a neutral commentator because even in England, if you're commentating in England, on England, you'll know that there are many fans watching who will be supporting Pakistan, there'll be many fans watching who will be Indian or, or whatever nationality it is. So I think it's important to maintain a bit of neutrality. That's maybe an old-fashioned view, I don't know, but I still think it's quite important to do that as a broadcaster. Um, so I, I never use the word we, you know, I, I always kind of speak neutrally as a, as a commentator. Well, it's all, I mean, it's all rolled into one now in the sense that, you know, we, we still commentate on the game as we always have. I'll still write a thousand words on a game as I always have, but obviously we're aware now that social media is very important I mean you know I have a Twitter account and a following but I'm not avidly on Twitter all the time I try and stay a little bit removed from it but you know around the cricket and the coverage we will do short clips uh, we will do two or three minute pieces we're aware that you know people of a ge different generation want shorter clips on social media and that's how the game is followed so you have to be aware of all kinds of media, old media, new media, and you have to try and be adept at bringing it all together and doing both sides of it.
Well, I just made a conscious decision. You have to, before you kind of get involved on social media, you have to, I think, say to yourself, what are you trying to get out of it? And for me, uh, as I say, I, I try and stay a little bit detached. I try and stay fairly rational on there because it's not always a rational place. Um, and of course, other people use it differently. Um, and you, they'll use it to create controversy and drive, you know, followers to them or try and get as many clicks as possible. But it's just not, it's not how I do it. And, and I've kind of made that decision and I'm going to stick with it for a while. I'm not saying it's the right thing to do and I'm not telling other people how to do it, but that's just kind of my, I'm comfortable with that.